بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد حياكم الله my dear brothers we'll continue today إن شاء الله تعالى with explanation of the book الأربعون النووية by Imam Nawawi رحمه الله and we started on uh, Thursday to explain the hadith hadith Jibril where uh, the angel Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his companions and he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam a couple of questions. He asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam about Islam and then he asked him about Iman. And we spoke about that in uh, the former lessons and today inshallah ta'ala we'll speak about the third thing that he asked him uh, when he came to him. And that is Ihsan. So Jibreel alayhi salam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Akhbirni an al-Ihsan. Akhbirni an al-Ihsan. Al-Ihsan in the Arabic language is from uh, perfection or doing something good. Doing something in a good way. So if I treat someone well, I made ihsan to that person. I treated him in a good way. And if I try to perfect my actions, I try to do them in the best way, I make ihsan when I do these actions. And for an action to be accepted in Islam, it has to be hasan. It has to be hasan. It has to be good. It has to be accepted. And that has two conditions. It has to be sincere for sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second condition that it's in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But this level that we'll speak about today is ihsan. And that is a higher level than just getting our actions accepted. So if we pray now, and we had sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we prayed in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then our action was accepted, our prayer was accepted inshallah ta'ala. If we will fast in Ramadan, and we have sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of Allah, and we fast in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then our fasting will be accepted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to have ihsan is something on another level. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained that in this hadith. When he said, and ta'bud Allah. And ta'bud Allah. That is the first thing, that, is that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we have to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a specific way. In a specific way. And that specific way has two different levels. The first one is called mushahada. And the second one is called muraqaba. Mushahada is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the beginning of the hadith. Or in the beginning of his statement when he said, And ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah. That you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you are seeing Him. As if you are seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars explain this by saying that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ka'annaka tarah. The meaning is not that we can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Because it's impossible for us to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya. If we are believers and die as believers, we will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of resurrection and we will see Allah azza wa in, in paradise. But in this dunya, then we can't see, uh, we can't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this, كَأَنَّكَ tara, Then the meaning of that in Arabic is, أَثَارْ sifatihi, That you see 
the effects or the traces of his attributes in every single thing. So when we see this universe around us, the world, we see the sun and so on, we can see that it is an effect. We can see the traces of the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He is the Creator. When we see something that is created, we straight away we think about the Creator, the one that created it. When we see that something is designed in a perfect ma- manner, we can see the attributes of Allah, or the effects of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the trace of the attributes of Allah azza wa jal, of al-hikmah, wisdom, knowledge. Uh, we can also see that Allah azza wa takes care of the creatures. We can see the traces of al-rahmah, mercy. And when we get something, some blessing, we see the traces that Allah is the one is Ar-Razzaq, the one who sustains and the one who gives, Al-Wahhab, Al-Mannan, and so on. So when we see things, we see them in this way. It's like a paradigm. We see everything in this way. It's like we put on glasses. We don't have the materialistic glasses that atheists have. When they see stuff around them, they see it in a materialistic way. They only see the material world around them. But we see everything around us that it is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we worship Allah azza wa jal, this is how our hearts should be. كَأَنَّكَ تَرَى This is mushahada. This is a high level of worship. That's not the kind of worship that everyone does. That you worship Allah Azza wa Jal like you are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of resurrection. That you are in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a big difference between that kind of worship and the one who's just standing, is praying, Everyone else is making a ruku, he makes a ruku, he's not, he's not thinking about anything, he's not concentrated, it's not, no khushu, no nothing. So it's a big difference. And this is something that we should strive to attain. And then the second level that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned was, فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يراك. That is what is called muraqaba, muraqaba. That you know that Allah Azza wa Jal see you doing every single thing. When you're praying, you're so concentrated, you have so much khushu that you know that Allah Azza wa Jal is watching you. Watching every single thing that you do. And subhanAllah, to worship Allah Azza wa Jal in that way, it's totally different from just worshipping Allah. You sincere, you're doing it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla, doing it in accordance to the sin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but worshipping Allah Azza wa Jalla in accordance to Ihsan, that's the highest level of our religion. And this is something that we should strive for. And the way to attain that is to learn about Tazkiyat al-Nafs, learn about Ihsan, learning about how to purify our souls, and about the actions and the deeds of the heart and so on. This is very, very important. And we can see many, many verses in the Qur'an, many ahadith of the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, many sayings of the sahaba and the tabi'un and so on, when they were speaking about these things, about the heart. And something that is very strange is that we can see some Muslims when they are trying to make purify their souls, and their heart, and so on, they're not basing this purification on the Qur'an, and the Sunnah, and the sayings of the Sahaba, and so on. They're basing it on statements of people, or ideologies of philosophies, that were taken from other religions, from Hinduism, from Buddhism, 
and from other philosophies and so on. And they are saying we're just striving to purify our souls. We can't purify our souls except with that that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was it's in accordance to the Quran and the Sunnah. This is how we purify our souls. And this is very important that we learn about this, the verses in the Quran, about this subject, and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, dealing with this. And when we pray, or to have ihsan, if someone really has ihsan, in how he's worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also how he treats other persons, then he will attain the love of Allah azza wa jal. Because Allah azza wa says, وَأَحْسِنُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And have ihsan, do ihsan. And you worship of Allah azza wa and how you treat others. Because verily Allah azza wa loves those who have ihsan, those who are muhsinun. So, we should strive to have ihsan in every single thing that we do. And then after that, Jibreel alayhi salam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam another question. He said, وَأَخْبِرْنِ عَنِ السَّاعَةِ Tell me about the hour. And the hour is one of the names of the day of resurrection. Yawm al-Qiyamah, Yawm al-Deen. As-Sa'ah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered him by saying, مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمْ مِنَ السَّائِلِ And this is a very beautiful response. When he said, the one being asked has no more knowledge about it than the one who is asking. The Prophet ﷺ did not say, I don't know and you don't know. He said, the one that is asked has no more knowledge than the one asking. And subhanallah, the one asking is Jibreel alayhi salam, the best of all angels. The angel that hears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech, the kalamullah, and delivers that speech to the best of all human beings. Okay? He came to Adam alayhi salam, and he came to Nuh, and he came to Ibrahim, and he came to Musa, and he came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The best of all angels. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like we spoke about yesterday, is the best of the best of the best. The best of all human beings are the prophets. And the best of the prophets are the messengers. The best of the messengers are ulul azm. And the best of ulul azm is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the best of the best of the best. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, to Jibreel, مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِعَالَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not know when Yawm al-Qiyamah is. And Jibreel alayhi salam does not know when Yawm al-Qiyamah is. The only one does know, that knows when Yawm al-Qiyamah will be is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we really understand this, we can see the problem when people are speaking in terms either that they say, I know that Yawm al Qiyamah will be the next year or in 2025 or so on, or that they're speaking like they're speaking in terms that you can understand that, okay, maybe next year it will be Yawm al Qiyamah. They don't know. They don't know. We can know the Yawm Al-Qiyamah is really, really close when the big signs of the Day of Resurrection will occur. 
like when Dajjal comes and Isa alayhi salam comes and so on. But when will that be? Allahu alam. We don't know. So speculating about these things, speaking about them, either to say that, okay, the day of judgment will be probably after two years or three years. Or do you speak in terms that you can see, okay, because this war is happening now in this country, it means that Yawm Al-Qiyamah will be just in a couple of years and so on. We don't know. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not know. Jibreel Alayhi Salam did not know. So we don't know. But what did the Prophet, uh, what did Jibreel ask him? He said, أَخْبِرْنَا عَنْ أَمَرَاتِهَا Tell me about the signs. There are signs that the day of resurrection is close. That the day of resurrection is close. The signs of the hour, signs of the day of resurrection, of the judgment, of the end of the world, are of three kinds. Of three kinds. The first one are signs that have occurred in the past. And one of the biggest of those signs is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came. Because he is the last of all prophets. He is the last of all prophets. So there will be no prophet after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is something that happened. And there are other things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about that will happen in the future and they have happened. Many things. Like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about the khawarij. That they will come out and so on. And we could see that they came out in the days of Ali radiallahu an. Uh, they started in the days of Uthman and they came out and formed a group in the days of Ali radiallahu an. And then they continued and so on. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about that. And many other things. And the second category are things that are the minor signs that occur right now, that we can see around us right now. And there are also many. And if we go back to the books about the signs of the hour, we can find many of them now, and we can see them. It's part of the world now, things that are happening in our age if we would have a time machine to go back 500 years to tell people about things that happens today, I don't think anyone would believe in us. Would tell them about mobile phones. You know, I can sit here in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I can call someone in China and I can call someone over there in Andalus and so on. People say, no, no, this is impossible. How can you speak to someone? I can take a plane, I can go in the sky and travel to Andalus in three hours. So no, it's impossible. You have to take the camel for a month or something. That's impossible. Internet. Many things that we can see in our days are things that if we would try to understand them 500 years ago, 200 years ago, maybe just 100 years ago, would say that would be impossible. Just electricity. Just if you if you read a hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us about the munafiqun, the hypocrites, that the hardest prayers for them to pray is what salat al isha and salat al fajr. Why? Because it was dark in the mosque. No one could see them. They just come into the prayer so people can see that they're praying. They're not praying for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when it was Salat al Isha in the Prophet of uh, the, the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was totally dark here. And now we're sitting in the mosque and it's lights all over the place. This is something new. If we would speak with people in the days of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about these things, or just people living a hundred years ago and so on, they will say these things are impossible. But now we can see them. And this is the same thing that we should keep in mind 
when it comes to some of the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he is speaking about the days, the, the signs of the hour. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you read some of the hadith, it's, it's like mind-blowing. It's like, wow, Tajjal, what he's doing, going around all around the world, and he was doing this and this and that, and this thing would happen, yeah, Juj or Ma'juj, and so on. It might be mind-blowing. Think like, can this really happen? Yes, it will happen. The Prophet sallallahu told us. We might not understand it now, but when people will see them, it will be real. So, keep this in mind if someone asks you about these things. Can this really happen? This thing about Ya'juj and Ma'juj and Dajjal and some of the signs the Prophet ﷺ told us about. Yeah, it will happen. If there are authentic hadith, ayah, verse in the Quran, yes, it will happen. We can't understand how, but we know that it will happen in accordance to the way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about. So, the second category are things that are happening right now. And one of the things that are happening right now is the, one, the thing that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about in this hadith, when he said, Taral, Hufat al-Urat al-Ala, when you see people that are almost naked, they don't have anything on their foot, not wearing any shoes, they're poor, and they used to take care of, uh, of uh, sheep, farmers, they start to يَتَطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ Every single one, is, uh, they are competing amongst each other to build the highest buildings. And this is something that is strange. People that are poor, people that don't have so much clothes, and so on, they will compete to build highest buildings. And we can see these things in our age now. People that used to be poor, come from poor conditions, maybe their fathers used to live in the desert, or used to live in the villages, and so on. They were really, really poor. And now, they are competing to build high buildings that will be totally impossible to build just a couple of years ago, or a couple of decades, or centuries ago. But now it's possible. So, this category are the signs that we can see around us right now. And the third category are the major signs. The major signs. Like that Isa alayhi salam will come back. Al-Mahdi, Dajjal, Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, and so on. These things will happen very, very close to the day of resurrection. When these things start to happen, we know that we are really close to the day of resurrection. And it's very important that when we read these ahadith, we understand them in the light of the other ahadith and in the light of the understanding of the sahaba and the tabi'un. Because today, it's very popular, especially in YouTube and other social media, that people try to explain the signs of the hour with very, very strange explanations. So when they're speaking about Dajjal, they're saying Dajjal, he has only one eye. Okay, that means that it is the television. Because the television is just one big eye. No, this is, not, this is not how you can understand the hadith. If we really read all of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Dajjal, then this is not the description of Dajjal. He's a human being. He's not a television. And so on. We can find many, many strange explanations today about the science of the hour. And this is a big fitna in this age. 
especially with social media, people want clickbaits. People want you to go into you to your YouTube channel or TikTok or Snap or anything like that. So you come out with like big titles. You say, now they found the jail or something like that. And everybody's just clicking on your YouTube channel and go in. And this is a big fitna, subhanAllah. These kind of things, you used to have people making ta'wil and uh, doing these kind of things before too. Maybe they wrote a book and so on. But the way that we can see it in this age, it's totally different. Because subhanAllah, you can see someone that is totally jahil, does not have any knowledge at all. And he's speaking about these issues and you can just open up his mobile phone and start to look and you have... Sometimes you can see millions of people watching these clips. So it's very important, Ikhwan, that when we study about the signs of the hour, we study, we understand them in the light of the other texts and in the understanding of the Sahaba. Like I said, the Dajjal, it's not just one hadith about the Dajjal, there are many hadith about the Dajjal. So if you want to understand who Dajjal is, read all of the ahadith and how the scholars explain that. And then you can understand who Dajjal is. And that all of these fake explanations today are not correct. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned two of the signs of the hour in this hadith. The first one, he said, he said, "Antalid al amma rabbataha." That the slave girl will give birth to her mistress. The scholars explain that in different ways. One of the ways is that a man, he has a woman that is a slave. And she gives birth to a child. And that child, uh, to, to a daughter, and that daughter will be uh, the owner of her own mother. Will be the mistress of her own mother. And the other explanation is that there are a great deal of undutifulness to parents in the end of times such that the daughter will behave to her mother as the mistress to her, uh, her slave by being disobedient. That uquq al-walidain will be more spread out. You can see that the daughter is treating her mother like she is a slave. If we read many of the signs of the hour, we can understand a general message, especially in these two signs, that things will be upside down. You can see that in this hadith. And tell it, Al-Ama Rabbataha, that the slave girl gives birth to her mistress, who come upside down. And tell it, al People that are they don't have, even have they don't have clothes, they don't have shoes, and they are poor, and so on. They strive to, or they compete to build highest buildings and so on. This is something that is upside down because usually, who is competing? People that are rich. People are rich. This is upside down. We can f- find that in many of the ahadith about the signs of the hour. And subhanAllah, especially in this age now, especially in this age, many, many things are upside down. If you really reflect on the world today, you will see that many things are upside down. Many things that could not be upside down in this way just a century ago. You see, like in 
almost all cultures around the world, they had some common values when it comes to, when it comes to the family, uh, the relationship between the man and, the, uh, and his wife and the kids and so on. And today, we can see that many values are totally upside down. And this is something that is really scary, to be honest. To see all of these things, and we can understand that we are coming closer to Yawm Al-Qiyamah, but Allahu A'lam when it will be. And then after that, Jibreel alayhi salam went away. Umar radiallahu an said in the hadith, فَلَبِثْتُ مَلِيًّا Then I waited for a while. In some of the narrations, it's mentioned that he waited for three. Did not say how long? Three. So maybe three days, three nights, but it was a while. It was not straight away. It was not like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them straight away that this, this was Jibreel. He said to them after a while that that was Jibreel alayhi salam. And subhanAllah, they never saw him after that. They never saw him after that. It was just this time that he came to them and he asked this question to the, uh, questions to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, we continue inshallah ta'ala with the third hadith Uh, the first two hadith were narrated by Umar radiallahu an, second uh, caliph. And this hadith, the third hadith, is narrated by his son, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. And he said in this hadith, سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ يَقُولُ I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he said, بُنِيَ الْإِسْلَامُ ala khams. Islam is built upon five, five pillars. شَهَادَةُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ وَحَجِّ الْبَيْتِ وَصَوْمِ رَمَضَانِ In this hadith, he mentioned hajj before before Psalm. So he said, the testimony that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger, is Allah's messenger, and to establish the prayer, to give zakat, and to make hajj, and to fast in Ramadan. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us in this hadith about Islam. Islam comes from the word istislam, which means submission. And it has different meanings in the Qur'an. It can be a general submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first category. And that general submission can be by force or by own will, by a person's will. The general submission by force is that every single thing is in the universe is submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of everything. Allah azza wa jal says, أَفَغَيْرَ دِينِ اللَّهِ يَبْغُونَ وَلَهُ أَسْلَمَ مَنْ وَلَهُ أَسْلَمَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ طَوْءًا وَكَرْهًا Do they want another religion than the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And to him, unto him, submits every single thing in the heavens and the earth, طَوْءًا أو كَرْهًا With their own will, or by force. So everything in the universe submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. No one can do anything except with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can see that 
in this incredible universe. The planets, the stars, the galaxies, the sun, the moon, are all submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the general submission of everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To His irada al kawniya His universal will. And then we have the general understanding of Islam that is mentioned in the Qur'an by will to al-irada al shariya the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the things that Allah Azzawajal loves. And that is mentioned about the former prophets, that they were Muslims. Allah Azzawajal says, مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ يَهُودِيًّا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيًّا وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا Ibrahim, alayhi salam, was not a Jew, nor a Christian, but he was a Hanif. Hanif is someone that worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with sincerity, and he was a Muslim. To be a Muslim in that sense, is to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with monotheism, to only worship Allah azza wa jal, staying away from shirk, and to obey the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Bani Israel, in the days of Musa alayhi salam, they were Muslims. If they worshipped Allah azza wa jal, and they obeyed Musa alayhi salam, and also the people that believed in Nuh alayhi salam. If they only worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they obeyed Nuh alayhi salam, then they were Muslims. This is a general understanding of al-Islam. And then the second category is the specific understanding of Islam or the specific meaning of Islam. And that is the religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the religion that all of us has to follow. So it's not allowed to say today if someone in his own understanding says that I submit to Allah, I'm a submitter, then that is enough. No, you have to submit to Allah Azza wa Jal and you have to obey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You have to say Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa Shadana Muhammad Rasulullah and follow the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in accordance to the revelation to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we can see today that some people that translate the Quran to other languages are now translation to English that mentions this in a very, very dangerous way. When they're speaking about Islam, they're translating Islam, not as Islam. Whoever wants another religion than Islam, that it will not be accepted to him. Then he translates it to whoever does not submit to Allah. Why? To say that everyone that submits to Allah then they will come to paradise in the end. Even if there are Jews and Christians and so on. The most important thing in the end is that you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the wrong understanding. This is someone that did not really understand the difference between the general Islam that the old prophets came with and the specific Islam that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. And in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the five pillars of Islam. <clears throat> and the first part of the first pillar was something that all of the Prophets agreed upon. Shadu an la ilaha illallah. And also, all of the Prophets uh, the, the former prophets, they used to tell their people about 
the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he will come in the future. But in those days, the people, they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they believed or they obeyed the Prophet that came to them. But we can see that the other pillars also, or many of the other pillars, there were pillars or there were legislations in the former messages of the former prophets too. We can see that they used to pray. You can see some verses about them they used to pray. You can see some verses that they used to give zakat or alms. So they used to give sadaqah, they used to give charity. We can see also that they used to fast. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتُبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتُبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Oh, you, oh, who you believe? Fasting has been prescribed for you just as it has been prescribed for those who came before you. So the people before us used to fast too. There are also some ahadith that the former prophets used to make hajj. Allahu alam, if all of the prophets may, used to make hajj, but there are some ahadith showing that Musa alayhi salam went for hajj in Mecca. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about that. And subhanallah, this is a scholar about the Old Testament. He wrote a book about Musa alayhi salam. About the story of Musa alayhi salam in the Old Testament. And he explained that the travel, the traveling that Musa alayhi salam did when he was in the desert for 40 years was not inside of the peninsula of Sina. But the villages that are mentioned or the places that are mentioned are inside of the Arabic peninsula. And he showed a map of these places and then Musa alayhi salam went around Mecca. Subhanallah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about that. Allahu alam, if it's true or not, but it's pretty incredible that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that Musa alayhi salam came all of the way down from the peninsula from Egypt, come down to Mecca to make Hajj. Allah knows best, but we can know that we know that that He made Hajj. So we can see that the pillars of Islam were also legislation for the former press, uh, prophets. They prayed, they fasted, they gave charity, and they made Hajj, and they said the Shahad of La ilaha illa Allah. But the former prophets used to have some rulings that are different from the rulings that we have. So there are some some differences, but the basic the basics, the basic beliefs and the basic forms of worship are the same. We can see that these pillars of Islam are of different kinds if we reflect on them. Look at the first pillar. The first pillar is based on belief in the heart and a statement of the tongue. That you believe in your heart, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. It's based on belief and it's something that you say with your tongue. The prayer is based on things that you do with your body. And things that you say with your tongue. Allahu Akbar. You raise your hands, you say Allahu Akbar. Sami Allahu liman hamida and so on. Zakat is based on something that you do with your money. Or your wealth. That you give away something of your wealth. It's not something that you say. It's not something, okay, you give it with your hands, but you can... Uh, you can make someone else give it for, for you. So it's not really an action, something that you, a ritual or something like that, that you do. It's money that you give away, wealth that you give away. And the fourth pillar is something that you do with your body, 
by abstaining from eating. It's not something that you actively do when you're fasting. You eat before and you eat after, but when you are fasting, you're not actively doing something. You're abstaining from doing things. You're abstaining from eating and from, from drinking and so on. So that's another kind of worship. And when we look at Hajj, we can see that it's statements that you say, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ Things that you do, things that you do, you go around Kaaba and so on. Things that you abstain from, because when you're in Ihram, it's not allowed to put certain clothes on and so on and so on. And you also use your money when you are when you are slaughtering an animal. And when you're traveling, you need money too. So Hajj is really incredible, subhanAllah. Collects all of these things. And we are making Hajj, you are saying, La ilaha illallah many times in your talbiya and, and when you're making uh, dhikr and so on. So these are the different kinds of pillars in Islam. And the first one is Shahadat an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Like I said, uh, I think it was on Thursday, that a shahada is something that is based in the heart and something that you say on your tongue, with your tongue. If you say it with your tongue, and you don't believe it in your heart, then it's not accepted. The hypocrites, in the days of the Prophet wasallam, they used to say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. But that's not accepted from them. They will be in the lowest part of hellfire. Lowest level of hellfire. And if you believe in your heart, if someone believes in his heart, that Allah Azzawajal is the only one worthy of worship, and that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, but you don't say it with your tongue, then it's not accepted. Because you have to believe it in your heart, you have to say it with your tongue. You can say Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a prophet with his heart. But he never said it with his tongue. Subhanallah. So, shahada is something that you believe in, in your heart, something that you say with your tongue. And the correct translation of shahadu la ilaha illallah is there is no deity worthy of worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can see that some non-Muslims, when they're translating shahada, they say, there is no God but God. That translation uh, is quite misleading, because it's hard to understand what you mean. The correct translation is, there is no deity worthy of worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the word ilah in the Arabic language means something that is worshipped. Something that is worshipped, deity. can be something in the imagination of a human being. He might believe that there are other gods in the universe, and then he worship them. Like the Hindus, they believe in Shiva and Kali and Ganesha and all of these imaginate the, the, the imaginations that they have of different gods. Or it can be material ob- objects. Some people they worship money, some people they worship statues, some people they worship uh, trees and the sun and the moon and so on. These are things that exist, not imaginations, but they are not worthy of worship. They are not worthy of worship. The only one that is worthy of worship is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And the shahada, shahada la ilaha illallah, is based on two pillars. And has seven conditions. Two pillars. The first pillar is negation. And the second pillar is affirmation. Negation, that you negate that there are any kind of, uh, there is anything that, that is worthy of worship. Nothing is worthy of worship. And the affirmation is that Allah Azza wa Jal deserves worship. So if someone would say, yeah, I worship Allah. I worship Allah. I pray to Him, I fast and so on. But I also worship other gods. I also worship something else. Then, he is not truthful when he's saying, Ashhadu la ilaha illallah. Because he's only affirming, he's not negating at the same time. And some people, they say with a tongue, yeah, I only worship Allah, and then they're in fact worshiping others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're making dua to others than Allah azza wa jal, to righteous people, to angels, to jinn, and so on. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ad-du'a huwa libada. Ad-du'a huwa libada. Ad-du'a is worship. So if someone is making dua to someone else, to a righteous person, or to an angel, or to a jinn, or so on, then they are worshipping them, because this is a form of worship. If you would say someone, he's sitting now, and making supplication, he's making dua to Allah, Azzawajal, oh Allah, give me this, give me that, I want to get married, and I want so, so, so. And then, one minute later, he's saying, oh, the messenger of Allah, give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. Oh, this holy person, or this wali, and so on, give me this, give me that, and so on. Either you say that he was not worshipping Allah Azzawajal when he was asking Allah for those things, or that the thing that he is doing right now is worship. It's worship. It's a difference when you ask someone for help. If I ask you, can you j- please give me a bit of water? That's, that's one thing. That's asking someone for help. Making dua is when you submit to someone. Your heart, you feel khushu. You feel concentration and you are calling upon someone that is not there. If I ask you now, can you please give me that water? This is asking someone that is living and he has the power to do that thing, and he is close to me. That's something. But if I would say, sit now and start to pray, to make supplication to someone that is dead for hundreds of years, does, does not have the power to do that, that would be a supplication, that would be a dua. So, La ilaha illallah, two pillars, negation, that we don't worship anyone except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the affirmation. And when we say, لا معبود بحق إلا الله, because the word ilah in the Arabic language means ma'bud, something that is worshipped. And we are affirming this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means that we are submitting ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to worship Him. And worship, the meaning, the essence of worship is every single thing that Allah azza loves and is pleased with from statements or actions or things that are in our hearts. So, Every single thing that Allah Azza wa loves and is pleased with is a form of worship. Things that we say when we read the Quran, we make dhikr, dua, and so on. Things that we do with our bodies, like 
praying, fasting, hajj, umrah, and so on. Things that are inside of our hearts. Like tawakkul to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to rely on Allah azza wa jal, to have fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so on. So, all of these forms of worship, it's only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the scholars also mention that shahadatu la ilaha illallah has seven conditions. The reason that they mention seven conditions is that we can, if we read the Quran, and if we really ponder on the sunnah and the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we can see that La ilaha illallah is mentioned together with different conditions. And that there are people that will say La ilaha illallah and they will come to hellfire. Like the hypocrites. So the scholars, what did they do? They went back to all of these verses and all of these ahadith and they saw that there, these, there are seven conditions mentioned in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. I can take an example. To have knowledge of La ilaha illallah. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, مَنْ مَاتَ وَهُوَ يَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ جَنَّةِ The one who dies and has knowledge about La ilaha illallah will come to paradise. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in this hadith, not only say that the one who dies and says with his tongue, "La ilaha illallah," will come to paradise. Now he said, has knowledge. So the scholar said, "Okay, this is a proof that you have to have knowledge about the meaning of La ilaha illallah." So if someone, you can see that sometimes people make pranks. Allah musta'an. They go to a non-Muslim. And they say to him, I will teach you some Arabic. He said, okay, say after me. Yeah, okay. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Ah, you became a Muslim. No, he didn't become a Muslim. He didn't understand what he said. It's not certain. He did not submit and so on. So we have to have understanding of the meaning of la ilaha illallah. That's the first condition that the scholars mentioned. And we have to have certainty. Not only that we have understanding, so if someone that has knowledge about Islam, is a non-Muslim, is reading in a book, okay, I understand the meaning of La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah means there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. No, he did not become a Muslim now. He has to be certain. He has to have certainty in his heart when he's saying that. And the third condition is that you have acceptance. Acceptance of La ilaha illallah and everything that comes with La ilaha illallah. Because saying La ilaha illallah is not just something that you have in your heart. You say, yeah, I, I, I'm certain. I know the meaning. Uh, and I'm certain that this is correct. No, accept the meaning. The essence of La ilaha illallah. And the scholars mention after that submission, al inqiyad, that you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not just something that you say, La ilaha illallah. Are you certain? Are you accept it? No, you have to submit to Allah. You have to worship Allah. To say La ilaha illallah, are you not praying? Are you not fasting? You're not doing any good deeds? Do you not submitting to La ilaha illallah? Do you not understand the true essence of La ilaha illallah? And the fifth condition is truthfulness. Sidq. Because the, the hypocrites in the days of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when they said La ilaha illallah, they were not truthful. They were lying. They did not say it from their hearts. So you have to be truthful. And the sixth condition is sincerity. 
that you only do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not saying la ilaha illallah, so your parents will be happy, or your surrounding will be happy, and so on. That's not sincerity. Sincerity is that you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the seventh condition is that you love la ilaha illallah and everything that comes with la ilaha illallah. To have love for Allah azza wa jal, to have love for la ilaha illallah, to have love for the people of la ilaha illallah, for the Muslims, to have wala, to have muhabba, love, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the conditions of la ilaha illallah. الْعِلْمُ وَالْيَقِينُ وَالْقَبُولُ وَالْإِنْقِيَادُ فَدْرِ مَا أَقُولُ وَالصِّدْقُ وَالْإِخْلَاصُ وَالْمُحَبَّةُ وَفَقَقَ اللَّهُ لِمَا أَحَبَّةُ Like the scholar Hafid al-Hakimi rahimahullah mentioned. Knowledge, certainty, acceptance, submission, truthfulness, sincerity, and love. And the Second part of La ilaha illallah is when the Muhammad Rasulullah, the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is affirming that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose him to be the messenger and the prophet, the last messenger and the last prophet to all of mankind. The scholars mention Four things, four things about, La, uh, about Muhammad Rasulullah that we have to do. Ta'atuhu fi ma amar. That we obey the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in those things that he, uh, that he says to us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says different things, then we obey him. Prophet Sallallahu said, "Man ata'ani dakhla jannah." The one who obey me will come to paradise. And the second thing is to believe in everything that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about the angels, about the former books, and the former prophets, and about the afterlife and so on. We believe in every single thing that is authentically narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the fourth thing is to stay away from everything that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prohibited us from. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prohibited us from shirk, polytheism, and from zina and from drinking alcohol and all of these things. We we'll stay away from it. And the fourth thing is that we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We do not worship Allah azza wa in our own way. We're going to pray Salat al-Isha together now. It's not allowed that someone will say, okay, I will pray in my own way. No, we have to pray in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We'll speak about that in uh, one of the ahadith. Uh, later, inshallah ta'ala, maybe the next week, inshallah ta'ala. So these are th- four things uh, that we have to do when it comes to shahat anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And of course, when it comes to obeying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if someone is not obeying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in anything, then he's not a Muslim. But if he is obeying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in many things, and then he's not obeying him in some things, then that's another thing. This is a sin. This is not that he's not a Muslim because of that. When it comes to believing in everything that the Prophet wasallam said, then that is very, very important. It's not the same thing that you can say, okay, I believe in 50% of what the Prophet wasallam said, and I don't believe in the next. No, you have to believe in everything that the Prophet wasallam told us. If it's authentic a hadith. When it comes to staying away from the things that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prohibited from, it's the same thing when it comes to obeying. Some people might do some sins. That does not mean that they are non-Muslim.
Uh, naam. And uh, the fourth point, like, like I mentioned, is that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that does not mean that if someone is making an innovation that uh, he's not a Muslim, but in accordance to the kind of innovation that he made, then he is deviating from the path of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we should all strive to live up to these four points, bi ta'ala, to obey the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he orders us and to believe in everything that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us and to stay away from the things that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibit us from and to only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we'll finish inshallah ta'ala and the next week on Thursday we'll continue to speak about uh, the prayer, zakat, fasting, and hajj. And then we will continue with the other hadith of Arba'in and Nawiyya. Bidna Allah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa sallam.